uh, Simon Reeder, who just gave his, uh, his afternoon talk. Simon is at McGill University, and he is a behavioral ecologist. Next is Sarah Woolley, from, also from McGill University. And do you consider yourself a neuroethologist? Yes. Or? Sarah is a neuroethologist. And we have Malcolm McIver, and you're from Northwestern University. Yeah. And you consider yourself a... Neuroethologist slash modeler. Yeah. Neuroethologist slash modeler. And next we have Stephen Wise, and Stephen is from the Non-Human Rights Project. Where is that based? In the United States, and, and I consider myself a lawyer. <laughs> Stephen is a lawyer from the United States. So we will proceed by having each presenter um, summarize their talk, and then we will have a group discussion amongst the speakers, and then um, a brief uh, question period with the audience. So Simon, would you? Okay, we'll start with Malcolm. Go reverse order? Okay, we'll start with Malcolm. Okay, uh, I told you about a lot of different things. Uh, I think the essence of it is that uh, sentience, I propose, uh, underwent a large change um, induced by a very different set of sensory physics and habitat constraints once we came up on land. And the net effect of uh, those changes was essentially to expand the range over which we could see uh, massively, which uh, I argued facilitated the evolution of planning circuits in the brain. And uh, I showed you computational uh, results that sort of suggest that planning in vertebrates is effective only once you have a large sensory range and furthermore, that once you have a large sensory range over a complex habitat, planning really starts to pay huge dividends. And that, uh, so essentially what this is, is an opening, uh, essentially land coupled with the better sensory physics for vision in air uh, gives us a switch from being sort of trapped in a kind of a reactive bubble where we see threats or opportunities at arm's length and sort of driving in the fog with a deer on the road situation too. Uh, what we kind of take for granted in ambient awareness, which is we can sit and contemplate over large spatial and temporal scales um, and think about plans for the future. So that, that's essentially what my talk was about. Great. Right, so I moved from sea to land to air, although our birds spend a lot of their time just sitting on perches. But I, uh, my talk was mostly asking the question of what sorts of songs or song features do birds attend to, and why do they pay attention to those particular features? So trying to understand how things like developmental auditory experience or adult social and auditory experience can shape the kinds of, uh, the kinds of songs that birds like and in particular going into some of the neural mechanisms for that, thinking about how uh, things like the neurotransmitter dopamine might contribute to those associations or to those preferences. Uh, so I, well, I just spoke, so I was I kind of um, maybe repeating things a little bit, but uh, so I was talking about social learning, so how information is transmitted between individuals. Uh, I was talking particularly about um, these processes in fish and a debate in the field about where, how social learning works. Is it the product of associative learning mechanisms or um, evolved, uh, evolved traits? And trying to think a little bit about the, what those two points of view would mean for how animals are representing other, other individuals. So now we will have a discussion amongst the panelists. Um, I'm not exactly sure how you want to proceed with this, whether um, you guys have questions for each other that will stimulate discussion, or you just want to get right into the killjoy hypothesis and its alternatives. Simon. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to summarize your I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I am a discussant, I learned, and uh, so uh, if I, if I have anything to discuss, 
<laughs> I will. <laughs> Do you have questions? No. All right. Well, somebody should. I don't know. Should I, should I say something? Could just to kind of fill the gap. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I was really interested in this kind of idea of planning. But I was wondering about, I mean, planning is a kind of controversial term in the, in the cognitive literature. Mm -hmm. um, so how strong is the evidence that there is, there is future planning in non-human animals? Like how, and how does that match with your, um, your hypothesis of, of uh, it being linked to sensory yeah. so, uh, volume? Uh, crucial to making any progress when using terms like planning, learning, uh, et cetera, is to uh, operationalize them in a way that we can start to get traction scientifically. And so I presented, <clears throat> sorry, I presented a opera operationalization of planning, which may or may not be satisfactory in terms of mapping onto this controversial topic. So the operationalization is pretty straightforward and it's rooted in algorithms that are now presently being used for things like uh, beating the world champion uh, player at Go. Uh, and, and that algorithm is essentially turning the cognitive operation of planning into a tree search where you have a tree, a branching tree of possibilities. Um, the exact variant of that tree search that we use is Monte Carlo. Um, tree search, which is actually the same thing that AlphaGo uses. The reason you use Monte Carlo as a sampling strategy on the tree is because the tree is too huge. You end up with a, you know, there's 10 to the 128 board positions in Go, which is vastly more uh, positions than there are atoms in the universe. So we're never going to be able to compute that. Um, but you can do a sparse tree sampling and it has very uh, positive consequences. So that's the algorithm we use, Monte Carlo tree search, on uh, a, um, <clears throat> a tree representation of the decision process over these simplified grid worlds. So planning is operationalized to um, searching through the tree, finding terminal nodes, uh, propagating the rewards back up that tree, picking the action which will lead to the largest reward value. All right. Now, does that match? precisely what we mean, mean by the psychological uh, term uh, planning. Um, I doubt that it's a perfect match. I think it has a close family resemblance. Uh, but from my, from my standpoint, um, we're, we're, the, the contact really is with things like vicarious trial and error, where you see things in rodents, evidence that rodents will sit, pause, and contemplate uh, paths, and I showed evidence that they do so, uh, neural, neural evidence that they do so by using things like their hippocampus to uh, imagine futures. There's a bunch of other data, such as if you um, look at uh, humans that have hippocampal damage and compare the, them to humans that don't have hippocampal damage, and you ask them to imagine you are at one of a host of everyday scenes, and, and one I remember in particular is you're at a beach. And uh, patients with hippocampal damage will say things like, I see sky, um, there's sand, and that's about it. And the non-hippocampally damaged humans will say, oh, there's a sky, there's a boat on the horizon, there's sand, the sand feels hot, I see kids running around, and on and on and on and on, for pretty much as, as long as you want people to go on. So in other words, they have a rich theater of imagination, which seems to be hippocampally dependent. And likewise, in rodents, if you um, uh, damage your hippocampus, they lose about ability to vic vicarious trial and error behaviors. Uh, so from my standpoint, um, I think there is some isomorphism between uh, imagining the future, selecting across uh, simulated, internally simulated plans for the best one, and what we're doing computationally in, in, in the talk that I presented. But I, I would be the first one to agree that it's not a perfect match. I have um, questions for Sarah. Um, so there's this, 
you talked about um, the role of the developmental environment shaping um, the sort of the adult phenotype in terms of what um, individuals will prefer in terms of a mate. Um, so there's lots of, uh, not lots, I shouldn't say lots, there is some evidence in insects, uh, particularly crickets, where the developmental environment shapes the mating preference of females. So when they mature, depending on their environment, they will have a particular mate preference. And so some work out of Rob Brooks lab in Australia has shown that um, you can take a series of um, say male calls, let's lump them into high quality, low quality, um, and that will shape a female's preference. But some others have taken it further out of Marlene Zuck's lab and looked at indirect genetic effects and asked whether it, the genotype of the tutors has an effect. And Nathan Bailey has published, I guess, three really nice papers showing that not only does the, the, the phenotype of the, the tutor have a role, but particular genotypes will affect the outcome or the, the preference in the eventual adult. So, and this was all based on some models that a, a guy by the name of Jason Wolf published years ago on indirect genetic effects. And um, so that's one really neat thing, but um, uh, Rafa Rodriguez at uh, Madison, was he Madison, Milwaukee, showed that in tree hoppers, another insect, the actual plant that they feed on will affect the preference. So it's not only a conspecific genotype, but the genotype of the plant. So you take, what they did was they split a family, put them on different plants, mm -hmm. and sisters had different mate preferences consistently. So there's, um, maybe my question is more of a comment. There's just a lot uh, going on in the social environment that's impacting that um, developing individual. Um, so I, um, in zebra finches, do you know anything about indirect genetic effects on female preferences? Is there, I didn't read anything. I don't think there is. Huh. I don't. I don't think there is. Uh, I don't think there's any work on indirect genetic effects, but I know that that sort of question of um, sort of looking at the genetics as far as bird, either bird song learning or production, or um, really nobody looks at preference in that regard as much. But there are people that are definitely interested in that, that if you, um, the ability of males from certain families, their ability to learn a song, some of them might be better at learning a faster song versus a slower song, and that will depend on what family they've come from. So it'll depend on the genetics of their father will influence whether they're good at learning something that's at a faster tempo or a slower tempo. And it doesn't mean they can't learn it um, if they come from a particular family, but it does influence how well they'll learn it. Um, yeah, sort of depending on what the genetics are that they've come from. But there aren't a lot of, there's only a handful of labs that are doing that kind of really clean um, sort of genetic crosses to try to figure out is it, yeah, is it something genetic from the father or from the mother that's influencing this learning ability? Um, but the Brainerd Lab is one that's working on that a lot and Kazu Wada in Hokkaido is doing that. There's a handful of places where people are trying to tease those pieces apart. I would love to get a hold of their females to look at exactly that question. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the studies like that in birds are limited logistically by doing large genetic crosses and whatnot. Yeah. You're limited by space for one yes. thing. Yeah. Um, I wonder if this would play a role in nature in, I'm not sure where zebra finches nest, if they nest in the same place over and over with the same neighbors. I don't know. I don't yeah. know that either. I don't know. I, they nest in bushes, um, okay. but I don't know a whole lot about how site, um, how site selective they are, how site, how, yeah. yeah if they okay. keep the same site from year to year. He's, I was wondering Plus if in, mentioned. say, like colony nesters, mm -hmm. like something like a thick-billed myrrh that is generation after generation, the family is always kind mm -hmm. of around, and you know, the Johnsons are next to the Smiths. 
right. and it's just generation after generation if they get to if they learn or are affected by these particular um, right, if you get sort of like almost a, like a, neighborhood. a bush dialect. Right? Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Like this bush has this particular dialect, and if you go 100 meters in any direction and come to a different bush, that one has a different dialect. So exactly. And if that influences, yeah, either preferences or learning or... And yeah. if you're a female and you end up two bushes down... Right, ooh. which you probably should because yeah. then you'll avoid, right. you'll outbreed maybe, right. but at the same time, will that sound weird to you? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Interesting. I also have a question for Sarah. Um, so um, this result showing um, topographic reorganization with dopamine uh, is, is really exciting. And uh, I'm wondering what your thoughts on uh, circuit mechanisms. Uh, obviously, dopamine is important, and the VTA connects uh, motor cortex. Do you have any more specificity on what the circuit is oh, as for far reorganization as, of as how those those changes in say secondary auditory yeah. cortex are happening as yeah, a consequence yeah. of that the circuit circuit level details right um, so we don't we're at the moment we're trying to do some tracing back to figure out the particular population of VTA neurons that are projecting so we know that the ventral or dorsal population do you think um, well for us it's the caudal VTA the caudal. so okay. yeah so it's I guess posterior, it's mm -hmm. usually called in mammals. Um, so it seems to be that population certainly is the one that's st showing the biggest effect for preferred versus non-preferred stimuli. And we see a hint of tracing back from the NCM to sort of a region just dorsal to that caudal population. Mm -hmm. So, um, but we're still, that's very, very early days in figuring that tracing out. Mm -hmm. um, but we do know that like there's there seems to be a, um, somewhat distributed population that projects to like the basal ganglia area X, which is the mm. sensor, the nucleus that's important for sensory motor learning mm -hmm. in birds. And it's a pretty sparse population that projects to there. And our prediction is that it would also be a, a handful of cells that are projecting up to auditory cortex in the same sort of way. There's not, it doesn't seem to be a, a huge target for dopamine up there. Mm -hmm. But as far as, um, as far as sort of circuit level mechanisms for how that's working, that it's sort of up in the air, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, it does seem to be a physical stimulus as opposed to just a visual one. Mm -hmm. And so we know that, that VTA and Nigra get, um, they get visual input. Nobody knows a whole lot about a sort of somatosensory input that they're getting, and mm -hmm. in birds anyway. Mm -hmm. And so that's something we have to, to piece together too. We had sort of imagined that vision would be the next thing to look at, but the mating data that we have seem to indicate that it might be more somatosensory. And so trying to sort of figure that out next as well. Great. Any other questions? I don't want to leave you in the lurch. <laughs> no, uh, um, I would be remiss, uh, Malcolm, if, so my son, he's seven, and he's obsessed with um, electric eels. <laughs> And he saw me too. He saw that you work on electric fish. Yeah, yeah. And his one bit of trivia that he wants clarified is whether totally yellow for it. Um, <laughs> one foot of eel produces one hundred volts yeah. of electricity. Yeah. So a six foot his, eel. He knows his data. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Okay. So I actually can, surgically operated on one. We had to wear insulating gloves. And was, yeah, that was okay. It was really exciting because the the, the the shed aquarium, the giant aquarium in Chicago, asked me to uh, help with the surgery, and their question was, "Can they be sure that the electric eel is unconscious during the surgery?" Uh, so they wanted me to decide, figure out whether this is, <laughs> and so uh, it's uh, an important. Uh, uh, sort of empirical sort of thing that uh, that electric eels, unlike weakly electric fish, electric eels actually control their zap, which is a good thing because <laughs> if they were zapping like that all the time, they'd burn up too much energy. Uh, so they have voluntary control. So if we can apply a drug, in this case it was MS-222, and note that they stop the voluntary generation of the strong zaps, 
then you know we can have some at least some um, uh, hope that they are completely unconscious during the surgery. So we did the experiment, and I was the person verifying that they don't do the strong zaps. Really. How did you verify that? Um, <laughs> by just, just by. <laughs> no, uh, I, I had a variety of instrumentation on the animal to see the the, the blips without any uh, shock. Uh, so do you go into the wild to collect? I don't. I don't get. I don't get to do that fun. There's uh, fun. I don't know if you'd call well, that fun. Well, but... Rudiger Krahe, yeah. who as a uh, colleague of uh, these guys um, uh, does that work and I'm constantly saying well why can't you write me into your proposals to go down to the Amazon because I haven't been there and, yeah so one of these days uh, but I'm I'm yeah it's I, I get them through suppliers who yeah so you mentioned that it's um, energetically costly to produce this very zap. costly yes. oh, okay so how was that measured well, so people have done very precise uh, measurements, Rudiger Krahe among them, of the metabolic load of the weak discharge. The weak discharge is a millivolt, but it's continuous. This is 600 volts up to 0.1 amps, but it's very short, milliseconds. Right. Uh, but you can bas basically measure the voltage and the current and the, look at the time, integrate. And I can't recall off the top of my head um, based on typical discharge patterns, what the load is, but it's not insignificant. And they, so they have to, they have to be careful how they meter out their discharge. Yeah. So is this? Are they taking energy from the fat body, or like where does? So they have these super interesting modifications of muscle cells. So muscle cells have my mitochondria for right. generation of contraction. What they've gone and done is uh, there's been genetic modification of those muscle cells to stop con contractility. Right. The genetic basis of that is now understood. <clears throat> and uh, in, in this, so they seize contractility, they greatly enlarge them, and they pack them chock full of mitochondria. So you look at these cells, they're huge, and they're packed full of mitochondria. And all they do, po proton pumps, and they yeah. just all they're there is, a, is to generate energy. And okay. um, so that physiology has all been worked out and it's uh it's it's really impressive yeah did i answer your question i'm sorry yeah, yeah, let's, yeah. Get a little, let's get a little less technical well uh, and, and mix it up a little bit more remember that the phase is that the, the speakers are going to interact we're going to make them interact with themselves a little bit and then you get to ask questions i'm i i'm just going to mix up i'm not asking a question it is a question uh there's a there's a little bit of a contradiction between uh between uh, Simon's and uh, Malcolm um, and um, Malcolm's view of what's going on inside, and I want to ask Simon um, whether uh, tree sequential tree planning counts for you as general associative learning. Whether it counts as. Um Without thinking about it more than you know a few seconds, I would say I would say no, but maybe if you know. Well, that's bad news for the general associative learning theory, if it's to the extent that that kind of computation is necessary. Still computation, but, it's but that, not that, you mean necessary for social learning or necessary for planning? Well, I'm asking you. Well, I, I mean, I think I think my my view of planning is that there's not. You know, there's, there's, there doesn't seem to be widespread evidence of forward planning in animals. There is some, you know, there's some, there's some studies, but it doesn't seem to be something that's just popping out all over the place. Um, so that, so maybe, maybe that means that this isn't going on that often. I think maybe Malcolm would have have a have a different point of view, and I'd have to think a little bit about his view of planning. I mean, it seems to me with that that tree search, well, as you were saying, you very rapidly turn you run into the problem of there's so many options, right? Like with the Go example, which means that then I would expect there'd be some kind of heuristics for yeah, there is, yeah. You know, search heuristics. So you're not, you're not exploring the entire uh, parameter space. Um, but I, I, ten, I, I, I mainly think about those associative explanations for social learning. I haven't thought about them linked to, to planning because that's not something, you know, that's just not something I've, I've, uh, I've, I've thought about. You don't, uh, you don't think social learning involves planning much? <clears throat> um, no, 
No, I mean, no, you see, I mean, I think that was, that was one of the questions that social learning can almost be a substitute for forward, for forward planning, right? If I, if I can acquire an adaptive behavior from someone else by observing what they do, um, then I don't actually need to kind of, you know, have a mental representation of the world or, I mean, you don't like representation of that, but um, I don't need to, I don't need to, um, to do a kind of internal, internalized trial and error search of the world because I already know what works, right? So I think it would actually, I think that that idea of it being a substitute is a is a is a, is a good one. So can we have a chickadee uh, perspective on this? Mm. Uh, <laughs> a bird song perspective. No, so, yeah, a bird, bird song, song perspective oh, on whether planning is a form of associative learning. Is that what you want? Or well, are you happy with associative learning for underlying the? the uh, learned song effects that you study? That's an interesting question. So, so one thing that I think of when I think about your social learning work is whether, um, whether what you have is sort of a system where you've co-opted structures that are really good at associative learning and brought them under the rubric of in our case, vocal learning, but in under any sort of other social learning. So we know that like cortical basal ganglia circuits and dopamine projections to those are really great at figuring out the relationships between, um, between a signal and a reward, and then also figuring out how to, to refine a motor movement, right? How to go through this sort of sensory motor practice. And in songbirds, we have these hypertrophied structures that are um, are co-opted from the surrounding basal ganglia or cortex or wherever it is um, that are specific for song learning, but they're taking advantage of things that those circuits are inherently good at, this sort of associative learning process. And so what seems to happen is that the, the attention to a particular stimulus coming in gets refined through evolution. So you, you the birds focus or attend onto song as it comes in, and that's what gets memorized, and that's the template that's there, and then you use these co-opted circuits to refine your own vocalization to match that. Um, I'm not sure that that answers any of the questions, but this sort of idea of associative learning versus um, sort of a more general process or something else, and whether, I don't know how it relates to planning exactly, mm -hmm. but that's sort of how we I think about what it is that those circuits are doing and, and associative learning in that regard. And it's sort of, I don't know, maybe it goes more along with this generalized process as opposed to a specific circuits for social learning. Um, or maybe it's sort of a hybrid of the two because they're general circuits, but they've been specialized in a particular way to make them specific for social learning. I'm gonna try to uh, guess the um, intuitions that, that make, make you ask the questions that you ask. I'm guessing, in your case, uh, that, um, that you were influenced somewhat by the phenomenon of uh, categorical perception in human beings. The reason you gave those examples of, uh, of uh, Indian pronunciation of da and pa, uh, and our incapacity mm -hmm. to hear the difference was because in the back, you were thinking there was some learning that occurred in the case of those people that learned those languages that made them perceive it differently. That's a change in perception, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the, the, the usual option is there, forget about the perception, something is computing differently. Uh, there are two computational models at, at, at issue over here. One of them, yours, the associative learning is really what's now called uh, unsupervised learning. It's whatever, you know, comes out of repeated exposure, the correlations, etc. Yours, on the other hand, goes beyond that. It goes into the area of supervised learning and even um, a, a sort of a hypothesis, serial hypothesis testing. Both of these can happen in a robot, but what motivated you was that it sounds different. Not that you're doing a different computation, even with dopamine, right. but it sounds different. What motivated you um, if I'm not mistaken, Malcolm, was that it, it catches your notion that people think and plan. So? Oh, is that to me? Yeah. Sorry, yes. that uh, it captures my notion that people think and plan? No, no, but, that was Malcolm. Okay. Your, yours was perceptive. And Mine Malcolm's is perceptive, was, yes. So, so, Malcolm's was so in thinking. terms of uh, the modeling, I guess I'd be, I think, uh, unfortunately, I, I I was absent for some suck and, and really meant to attend it. Uh, I got lost, actually. Um, but um, from from um, what 
Simon and Sarah have said, I think that's largely modelable using standard reinforcement learning techniques, except for the change in the perceptual apparatus in the case, in your case. Yeah. So that is not something reinforcement learning tries to capture. It doesn't try to capture plasticity of sensory organs. Uh, but modulo that detail, associative learning, slow learning through multiple trials. Tempor there's a temporal difference model that uh, Wolfram and Schultz tested on monkeys and seems to have pretty good match to what's going on with dopamine uh, there. Um, and, and whether, I'd, I'd be curious to know whether you think associative learning, the way you think of it is modelable as standard reinforcement learning or not, or if you think something different is going on there. Or... Um, that's you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> to make sure I'm getting the eye yeah. contact. Uh, so what, what do you mean? So, I, I mean, I'm, so I propagation of, uh, so, so essentially you've got um, uh, a tree of possibilities again, but rather than doing planning over the nodes through something like Monte Carlo tree search, you do essentially you get to the terminal node, you get a reward, you do this a bunch of times, slowly the node propagates the rewards back mm -hmm. up using say dopamine. And so after many, many trials, you have an association between the terminal reward and mm -hmm. the link and the and the list of actions that led to that reward. Yeah. So that's the associative life mechanism. Would yeah. that capture the kind of learning you're trying to get at with social learning? Or I, I gather you're talking about mimicry a bit, so maybe maybe it's a No, I mean I, I'm not uh, no because I'm not I'm not really thinking about I'm you know planning at all. I'm thinking right, about right. No, I, I know yeah, yeah I'm thinking about examples. So for example a an animal choosing between food site A and food site B and they're attracted to a food site because other individuals are foraging there. Um, and so they, and then they'll learn about that food site and then they'll return to that food site later or they'll observe individuals foraging at a particular food site. So that, um, whether we need to map that onto a Monte Carlo, you know, into a, into a thought tree. I mean, I can, I can certainly, I, I'm not in a, yeah, I'm just not sure whether you need. I, I don't think you do. I think associative yeah. learning can be, captured by standard reinforcement learning, which is different from planning. Like, yeah. the, like standard reinforcement is different from planning. It sort of captures habit, it captures standard associative learning, but not so much planning. Planning I mean, is a slightly different affair. It would seem to be more applicable to kind of things, multi-step tasks, you know, right. like maybe something where you have to move in lots of different ways. Mm -hmm. and, may, and I think it may be as interesting where there's not intermediate rewards, there's just a final reward. So if you use a tool in a particular way, you can crack a nut or you don't get anything unless you do it right. Mm -hmm. You know, so there might, you know, there might be some kind of parallels between those, you know, those, you know, those structures or not, you know, when, uh, when we think about those, those kinds of, mm -hmm. or at least you can kind of borrow some of the theory yeah. and apply it to others. Yeah. Yeah. I can't resist to ask, uh, Sarah, your opinion, although it's not your domain so much, but there's a lot of, uh, Nikki Clayton and others push this idea for it a lot that the behavioral evidence is very strong for planning in birds. What, what's your thought on that? And they have hippocampi, essentially. They've got something almost exactly like the mammalian hippocampus. Right. So I, I don't know. It's hard to it's hard to not watch those videos of crows that have like eight tools that they have to work their way through. Um, and not think that there's some amount of planning going on there, or at least some ability to, for them to have some imagination of how mm -hmm. the steps could work. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I have trouble not imagining that that's right. planning. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's almost ready to be thrown open, but I'm going to try to seduce Steve into the picture by. Um, making something explicit that's implicit here. The, the subject matter that interests the three people sitting on your right uh, is partly behavioral, partly neural, dopamine, what have you, and partly computational. There's an interest in explaining how these organisms are functioning. But the motivation and the insight comes from the same place yours comes from, namely these birds perceive, hear things, the, the, the animals think things, 
they are sentient organisms doing these computations and this dopamine stuff. What about that? What about that? <laughs> um, was that leading up to this question? Did, did everything else lead up to that question? What? Uh, I really don't understand what you're asking me when you say, what about that? Did you, did you say you're a lawyer? I did. <laughs> okay. So asking for a, 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 a juridical opinion. A juridical opinion. About what is the substrate of all of these computations and neural processes, when that substrate is in fact felt, does it bring other considerations in than the ones that scientists have when they're in the Ah, okay. Yes. Uh, the, uh, well, as, as a lawyer, I'm listening to it because uh, you know, when, when I, I'm, I run the Non-Human Rights Project and the, uh, the sole purpose of the Non-Human Rights Project is to gain legal rights for non-human non animals. And uh, when, when we are trying to um, think through a case, try to think what case we want to bring, how we want to litigate a case. Uh, there's always, there's, there's two major components. You know, one is uh, we're trying to um, persuade the judges that they should be applying a certain kind of legal standard. And the second one is that if once we can persuade the judges or if we can persuade them that, or that uh, we want them to apply a legal standard, say that uh, if, uh, the one we've been using uh, for the last five years for chimpanzees and now elephants uh, is, the, is uh, the argument that um, uh, an autonomous being, that autonomy, whatever that means, uh, you know, is, is a sufficient condition for to have the right to bodily liberty protected by a writ of habeas corpus. And so we, we now know it, once, if, if, if we can persuade courts that that is so, then we have to go to the other side. We have to then speak to scientists. I spent a lot of time speaking to elephant experts, uh, uh, chimpanzee experts, uh, we're moving into orca experts, uh, and, and trying to understand uh, what evidence they might have of autonomy, how would they define autonomy, um, how, what, how would the, uh, the autonomy of our elephant compare to the autonomy of a human being, uh, th does the idea of of bodily liberty mean the same thing for our friend, for an elephant or a chimpanzee or an orca as it might to a human being, and uh, trying to um, you know see what facts we can gather. Um, we, uh, I, ha I think I heard a monkey. I think I think someone said a monkey. Other than that, we have not litigated the issue of, of birds. And uh, one one of the reasons, although Clayton, of course, I'm, I've I read about. Um, Luckily, I have a degree in chemistry, so I'm not completely scientifically illiterate, but uh, I, I clearly am way, way out of my depth, you know, sitting on this panel. You know, thanks a lot for putting me here. Uh, so, um, uh, we, we um, begin with th those non-human animals um, who we think um, have the kind of cognition that is both... Um, extraordinarily cognitively complex and for psychological reasons that is psychologically complex in a way that judges will relate to as human beings. Can I ask you one, one thing about yes. that? So you said though yes. that your criterion is autonomy, but we know that pretty much every living thing, including the C. elegans, the one millimeter nematodes we heard about yesterday have autonomy. So how are you going to, or, or do you welcome the case of we need to protect the rights of, of C. elegans. So what's your, what's your, how does your criterion generalize or do you not worry about that? Oh, oh we worry about everything. Um, autonomy is something, uh, it's, and actually uh, uh, I'll probably, I'll, I will be talking about this at greater length uh, unless I end up using everything now that I won't show up, but uh, <laughs> that, that we, what, what, what we do, I'm sorry. What, what we do, it's a new phone, so I'm not sure how to turn it off. There we go. So uh, what, what we do is try to understand when we're looking at, at a jurisdiction, 
what is it the judges value? Uh, mm -hmm. So we don't bring in our own biases. Um, uh, we try not to. And what we want to do is we want to understand what judges care about based on what, what they say they care about in their written decisions. So when, so we, when we do that in a Western jurisdiction, certainly within the United States, almost certainly Canada as well, you know, we, we saw over many years of, you know, reading hundreds and hundreds or thousands of judicial decisions that judges value autonomy. In fact, uh, to a large degree, they, they view their jobs as being to protect the autonomy of human beings and so that humans can do whatever they want within certain kind of limits. Mm. So we so we said, okay, uh, we then want to you know phrase our arguments in terms of what they say they believe in. Uh, so we then uh, adopt autonomy and we argue that autonomy is a sufficient though not a necessary condition you know for uh, at least the bodily liberty that would be protected by writ of habeas corpus. So then we go out to the experts you know, in, in the field, and uh, we asked them how, how they would view autonomy. Uh, one, one, one problem that, that we've had with judges is that they all seem to kind of implicitly understand what autonomy is, but we actually have never found a judicial decision that actually says what autonomy is. They just say it, we're protecting autonomy. What um, they say about worms? About worms? They'd say, "Would you get out of my courtroom? Uh, you know, we don't have, we don't have time for this." That that's what they would say about worms. I, we come close to we in the early days we came close to that with chimpanzees, and uh, and even now we'll go in front so, of the court. So, we might do that. But, so so I'm not sure if the autonomy, autonomy means a lot more than what we think of autonomy as. Well, you know, and, for and, for judges, I mean, and a science a scientific definition of. All kinds of words will have different kinds of meanings sure. to, no. to the judges. Totally, yeah. So, um, but they, they're thinking of autonomy for human beings. So, how do you sneak in chimps? Well, we're and we're talking about um, the autonomy that would be um, that would be uh, involved in exercising bodily liberty. So, in being able to move freely, freely around, and being able to want to do something, be able to plan to do something. So we we have our Planning. our experts come in who who talk about um, you know are they are the uh, non human are, are our chimpanzees or elephants or orcas are they conscious uh, you know are they conscious that they're conscious uh, do they have a theory of mind to what degree might might they have a theory of mind to what degree do they understand what's what's past do they what's present to what degree do they plan do what degree, do they understand that the, there's a future so we and also uh, Joyce Poole, for example the elephant expert. Um, in one of her affidavits um, related how uh, you might have a um, matriarchal-led band of elephants who, who are m moving along together and they have to make a decision as a group. And so she says that they then discuss the situation. And so I went back to her and said, uh, you really mean that? Are they discussing the situation? And she said, yeah, they're, they are discussing it. So I said, okay, well, we're going to leave that in, and I'll make sure I bring that to the you know, judge's attention. Uh, because she says uh, then after they discuss it for however long they're going to do it, they may then all move together, or they may end up splitting up, and those who don't agree with each other uh, go one way, and those who the, the others go, go the other way. So we begin with um, you know, really high levels of autonomy. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not... Uh, I'm not when, when you said... What, what, what animal... Did you say was autonomous? Uh, worms. A worm. worm. So, so, uh, and just so, it's very clear now that what you're saying is that what what the judges think of as autonomy is human autonomy, and by exercise of liberties, they mean exercise of liberties that conventionally have been restricted to humans, such as planning. But yes. we now know, or increasingly yes. are aware, that is not just restricted to humans. Yes. Uh, so it's a much thicker concept than just independence yes. from, because yes. a worm, a two millimeter long worm has autonomy in, in the sense of technical autonomy. And then what, what you're speaking about is, you know, we, we believe is a, is a double-edged sword. Uh, on, 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 to the extent that a judge believes that recognizing autonomy in a chimpanzee will mandate that, that she recognizes uh, the, the autonomy in a worm, she will not recognize the autonomy in a chimpanzee. Uh, so we not only will we not argue that worms are autonomous, 
we will deny it. And if it could, because the other side, that may be one of the tactics that the other side uses. All of a sudden they kind of do a judo flip and they start arguing, not just nobody's autonomous, all of a sudden they might start arguing that everybody, everyone in the animal kingdom is autonomous. Either way we lose. And so, uh, and so we have to um, begin, begin somewhere. So we're trying to make a wedge in, into the law which sees all non-human animals as things who don't have the capacity for rights. And autonomy, uh, because that's what judges value, has been the wedge that we have been working. Right. But what it means um, is not clear, although the latest opinion, or you know, the best one we, we've ever had in four years, the judge clearly um, ex embraced the idea of chimpanzees having autonomy, right. and it, it, it meant something to him. Yeah. So it's basically animals that have autonomy who do complex things who we like. So in other words, for example, the current, the leading neurophysiological model for planning outside of primates is rats. But nobody's, no judge is going to go, oh, all right, so we're going to extend all rights and freedoms to a rat, and therefore these rat poisoning campaigns that every city undergoes are unethical and, in fact, genocidal in, in nature. This seems like it's going to be a problem. Well, everything we do you know, is a problem because... Uh, because you have, you've had, you know, as long as there's been law, non-human animals have not had rights. As long as there have been rights, right. non-human animals have not had them. Right. So uh, judges, you know, for good or ill are human beings like the rest of us. And so uh, when, especially if you're a lawyer, if you're a judge and something has been a certain way since always, uh, it's kind of like if you're a heavyweight, you're having a heavyweight fight, um, you know, the contender has to clearly win. If, it, if it's anywhere near a draw, the, you know, the champion is going to stay, stay the champion. So we have, we have a, a, a big hurdle, uh, both intellectual and psychological, but also political. You know, a lot of, of judges in the United States you know, are elected. Mm -hmm. So we know that when we're having this conversation, they're thinking, uh, what's going to happen when the person runs against me and says, that's the guy who said that a, you know, a, a chimpanzee has rights. So there's social issues, there's historical, there's political, there's psychological, there's scientific, there's theological. Uh, so all of those are all coming together. And so it might look like there's like a lawyer standing up having a chat with a judge in the courtroom, but underneath of that, all hell's breaking loose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you just explain to the audience why you're now mixed Can I ask a, a, quick, a quick question? So can you just, could, just to kind of carry on with that, so what about this link between complex cognition and suffering? Like, I mean, is that, how do you justify that? Uh, I'm sorry, say that one more time? But it, it seems to be that why, why is it that you have to have complex cognition to be given these rights or to be, you know, to be classed as suffering? What, where, where are you evidence that from? Or is it just to appeal to the judge's um, preconceptions? Oh, um why don't we do it or why do we do it? Why do you, well, you seems to be that's, that seems to be the line you're taking, right? That complex cognition is linked to, uh, you know, there's more, welfare, there's more welfare concerns in a species with complex cognition than one with oh, less well, complex cognition. The, the reason we do it is that, um, again, judges have only lived in a world, only taught about, only learned about a world in which non-human animals, you know, have the same rights as the microphone, which are, which are none. So... Uh, we're we're also playing amateur psychologist all the time, trying to understand you know what's what's the path of least resistance to being able to to get them to out, actually grapple with our our issue because any we we have found that anything that they can do that will allow them not to grapple with it, mm -hmm. they will do that because they don't want to grapple with it uh, for all sorts sorts of reasons. So that's why in order to try to neutralize that to the degree we can, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we first study the judge's decisions to find out what they say they believe in. And so they, they're the ones who say they believe in autonomy if, if, and, and if, or that they value it. If they said that they valued sentience or if they said they valued blue eyes, we, we really don't care. Whatever they value, we will then go out and find scientists who, can, who will tell us which non-human animals will have autonomy, sentience, or blue eyes, and then we will... Um, use those as the facts to then argue based upon what the judges say that they believe. So we end up trying to put them into a corner and we, we're clear mm. that, mm. that we're trying to put you judge in, into a corner, um, which is that 
once we do that, you either have to A, say we're right and we win, or B, you made a mistake and we actually don't believe in that, or C, we do believe in that, but we're going to try to figure out some procedural or arbitrary way to get you out of my courtroom anyway. Uh, related to that, uh, in this country, um, there's a conversation going on about this with respect to plants. So there's been a number of, well, there are a number of labs now, a couple in Canada, one in Canada, a couple in the States, who have shown that plants have behavior, they have learning, memory. And there was a conversation recently, um, a workshop and a small conference in Alberta um, last month, talking about the ethical implications of this now. Do we cut down trees just willy-nilly? <laughs> Do they? Because people have shown that it's just beyond a uh, simple plasticity or response to um, a simple signal or something. This is coming up next week. Oh, okay. It's. Um, I, I just would like to say that um, almost judges tend to have degrees in political science and English, hmm. and. This conversation is way above the conversations I ever have in a courtroom. I mean, so we're constantly, you know, understanding what's going on ourselves. And when working with our experts to speak in a way that someone who has a degree in political science and English is going to un understand. Um, and also understanding what biases and what cultural biases they may have as you move from culture to culture. Mm -hmm. Because we also, um, while we litigate only in the United States, we, we, I, I constantly travel the world uh, working with lawyers who, want to, who are working in other countries. So in the last two months, you know, I've, I've been in Israel and India and Hong Kong and Malaysia and, and, and the UK and Sweden, and they all had different kinds of cultural and religious issues that are bubbling underneath of the, these sorts of arguments. Um, again, the idea, you know, and I, I follow to s some degree the idea of of plants, um, uh, I'm still stuck. For example, with the idea of insects, you know, when when I when uh, you know, in fact, one one of my books, I spent a lot of time talking about honeybees, and uh, you know, should they have, you know, what kind of cognition do honeybees have, and and uh, but the thing is, is that uh, um, I think we're pretty sure that that uh, if a judge accepts the idea that a honeybee or a plant, you know, is is going to have rights if they give the rights to a chimpanzee, then they will not give the rights to a chimpanzee. And so uh, the first thing we're trying to do is break through that barrier and bring some of the non-human animals over into the human person side and then deal with all that other stuff, you know, over the next century or so. Yeah, I, see, I'm done. I, I, uh, that's it. I don't have anything else to say. I just have one brief, I'm just thinking about what um, um, Malcolm's ideas about planning. Um, I know nothing about the evolution of planning or what's involved. I don't plan. <laughs> um, oh, yes, you do, yeah. Just trying to think, I'm just trying to, thinking out loud here. Um, planning seems really complex, right? Um, and I'm trying to equate that, um, just trying to understand how that would evolve and equate it with, say, like the evolution of the eye, which is a complex trait. Right. But half an eye is still an advantage mm -hmm. over no eye. Is half a plan an advantage? Totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a bad plan or a... So, so um, if you just think about... Um, uh, so I, I sort of gave you two different kinds of reactivity in my talk. One kind of reactivity results in the uncorking of a fixed action pattern, as it would be historically called in uh, neurothology and ethology where there's pretty much no degree of freedom and variation. And it's because it's under temporal duress. You know, you, you're trying to get the, the system to, 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 to do something as fast as possible. So get the egg back into the nest. Or, well, yeah, that's, that's a bit slower, but, but, but escape responses fall into this category very clearly. But uh, give the organism a few more milliseconds, tens to hundreds of milliseconds, and they will uncork a fixed action pattern, but has more variability. And I'm pretty sure, although I don't have the hard data on it, that uh, with more and more time, there's more and more variability. Um, and uh, the ultimate of variability 
is where you have such cognizance of your environment that you can sit and contemplate possibilities before the action is forced upon you mm -hmm. and then and then do something and but but i totally see it as a graded thing and I, I i don't think that half a plan is not no plan at all it's half a plan that gets you some something but, um so i i totally think it has a, a graded quality right. to it so individuals that have half a plan leave more descendants natural selection favors half a plan then selection can operate on that Correct. half a plan, make three quarters of a plan, yeah, yeah. and yeah. ratchet up to yeah. a yeah. full plan. Yeah. So, so in particular, if you take seriously the comments that I keep dropping on imagination, um, you can have very, very crude imagination and do something with it. And in fact, the, the people who have hippocampal damage do just that. Um, but with finer and finer quality of imagination, you can do finer and finer uh, forward action plans, uh, but the course one is better than none at all. So right. So Windows, no imagination. Mac OS, <laughs> full imagination. <laughs> could, could I just say actually one one thing? Who would have known that I would have had some ad here? Uh, <laughs> that is, uh, there's also um, science coming from the other side, which is that um, taking the idea that that that. Um, uh, human autonomy is kind of the apex. Well, I think there's, there's, I think we may not be as autonomous as we think we are, and, and, and right, we're gonna, we'll decide now whether there's such a thing as free will. But, <laughs> but, uh, but that, that is an issue. Yeah. So my question is relatively simple. It's mostly directed at Mr. McIver and Mr. Wise. Uh, Mr. McIver, you uh, used quite a bit of uh, computational data to try to predict behavior, basically, from what I understood. And I was wondering, how do you think that these data, or how do you think that um, artificial intelligence can be used to uh, predict evidence that could be used, potentially, and that maybe Mr. Wise can answer, uh, to argue in favor of animal rights. Can AI be used to argue in favor of animal rights? Um, indirectly, yes. Uh, so I think that um, the, the, the literature on computational planning is really taking its cue from animals. Uh, and uh, as the original reinforcement learning algorithm did as well, uh, all the authors there who developed those algorithms were just looking at animal data and going, well, how can, how can we do this, you know? Um, and they'll be the first to admit it, including Jeff Hinton um, and others. Uh, nowadays, they're getting such success that they kind of are, are saying to the biologists, we don't need you anymore. But most, most people view that as a, a bit of hubris that once we forget about AlphaGo, we'll hopefully go away as well. But um, certainly it's the case. So indirectly, because what the computational approach gives us is a clear enough frame uh, to, to start to do tests that make it clear whether or not uh, an organism meets the criteria for planning. And so if in the court case on chimps, the reason chimps are allowed in the circle of moral consider consideration uh, is because they plan, and then we show, well, uh, here's the data on chimp planning. Guess what? Here's the data on rodent planning, and they're doing it just as well. Maybe not quite as complicated as a, a plan as, as a chimp can do, but nonetheless clearly planning. Well, then that's a clear argument. But so uh, my view is that AI research can sort of give us fine-grained enough distinctions to come up with measurements that might be convincing uh, whereas I think one of the issues with the psychological term of planning is that it's a little vague and hard to operationalize. So I think it can have indirect benefits in, in that regard. And uh, there's also comes the other way around too, which I did not realize, but over the last couple of years, I find myself on uh, BBC shows discussing whether algorithms and robots should have legal rights. Mm, yeah, yeah right. um, And uh, it's sometimes not clear to me 
whether artificial intelligence entities or non-human animals will get will get them first. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Well, I, I, to so far, I, 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 I mean, I, I, once I realized I, that people wanted me on, like, on you know, radio shows to talk about whether you know algorithms should have rights, um, so I went out and bought some books about artificial intelligence so I could teach myself, and then I, I thought that I could not teach myself, or at least didn't have that much time. Uh, so um, I always say, um, if artificial intelligence entities have certain kinds of characteristics, then there's no reason why they shouldn't have certain kinds of rights. But I am not qualified to t talk about whether or not they have those kinds of characteristics or whether they will ever have those kinds of characteristics. Um, but if they do, then just as I would argue that species should not matter as to whether you have certain kinds of rights, I don't see why whether you're a, a natural entity or an artificial or an artificial entity wh why that should matter if you have the characteristics that would otherwise qualify you to be a rights bearer just to could i ask why you think it's such bad news so what what do you think is bad news <laughs> it's bad news for two reasons the smaller reason is steve's reason that worms would be bad news for his case for chimpanzees. That's the, but the other side, and I wish everybody would bear that in mind, is that chickens, pigs, horses, cows, chimpanzees, rats are all sentient creatures, and we know they're sentient creatures. There's no other minds problem in our minds, and they're being treated brutally, and we're worrying about algorithms. That's obscene. Hmm. And uh, well, I, I still have a question for Mr. Wise. Uh, with the judges right now, how they are, how they think, uh, do you think that this evidence coming from computational data, AI or whatever, uh, do you think that it would be accepted or do you think that it would rather have to be directly, the data coming directly from the animals themselves, behavioral data? Or whatever. Well, I've been looking for computational biologists for quite some time to chat with. I'm pleased to meet you. <laughs> it's. Uh, uh, I. I think that. I think that um, it'll be quite. It'll be quite helpful to us. I think in the future. Um, now that I have seen one, maybe I'll be able to see more. And, and maybe we can, can talk afterwards. <laughs> and uh, maybe you, I can talk to your friends. Because um, I think computational biology has a lot of promise. You know, for our work, um, always trying to remember remember the computational biologist that you're talking to somebody who you know majored in Chaucer. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mireille Goulet, and I happen to piggyback on what Stephen brought uh, forward. Uh, we've acquired a lot of knowledge on cognition and ability to feel uh, of just about every taxa. And yet, uh, we accept to exclude uh, taxa and sometimes even in species of same genus of others that we actually uh, give uh, legal welfare protection. We've seen that in Quebec uh, two, three years ago when we decided to uh, recognize that companion animals are sentient beings while at the same time excluding farm animals sometimes very similar or uh, of the same genus and at municipal level we do the same thing uh, it's forbidden to trap a dog in town but the city traps coyotes and that's well accepted so i guess my question is how do we reconcile both morally and legally this ex this exclusion and these opposed treatments and what criteria could we come up with so that we have a better um, inclusion of what deserves, what is deserving of legal welfare protection? Well, what, what the Non-Human Rights Project does is understand uh, that uh, right now, as it always has been, that all non-human animals are, are slaves. They're, 
their legal things, their property. Um, and, when, and when human beings have made someone a slave, or some, some entity a slave, or even other, other human beings, you basically do whatever you want to them. And so I think it's fair to say that we humans are used to treating non-human animals as things, as slaves, as property, and we do whatever we want to them. And the idea that we might be able, to, we, that we might have some kind of duties in some way not to do something to them, you know, is not even 200 years old. Uh, and so um, I, I think what, what, you, what you have to do is you have to come up with a goal, you have to have a strategy, you have to be persistent, and you have to um, realize that you are starting, you know, if you, on, you know, on a scale of one to a hundred, you're starting at, at two with, with some animals. With some animals, I might be starting at 30. And with other ones, I'm starting at two. And with some of them, I'm starting at like negative, you know, a hundred, like the worms. Uh, and so that's just how it is. And uh, it's gonna require an enormous amount of education, of moral education, of you know, in some re religious education, psychological education, scientific education, because scientists, I'm sorry, judges, politicians, they just don't know this stuff. And so uh, they need to um, understand it. And there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff to, to know. And they also have to be open to it in a way. So I walk in a courtroom, I know within 10 seconds whether the judge that I'm talking to is gonna be open to anything that I'm saying, anything, or whether they're just like waiting for me to go away, or they actually want to try to humiliate me. Uh, and so it's not easy to humiliate me. So it, it's, it's uh, it, it, you realize, um, you know, you just, you know, I'm talking to the judges now, though, in my head, because I don't want to go to jail. Um, you know, you're saying, you know, you really are ignorant. You know, you really, you don't, you, you don't understand what's going on, and each judge will or will not, just like every other human being around here, uh, will or will, you know, is starting at a different place. And so we have to understand what place each individual, you know, judge, just like every other human being, you know, is starting at. And there's, and, and everybody's starting at, at a different place with respect to different things, whether it's, you know, I may be at a different point in science than I am with ethics, than, than I am with law, than I am with psychology, or or economics. Um, so it's a, it's a very, very complex thing, but it's not that much more complicated than the struggle for human rights that, that, that has been going on for a long time and it is ongoing. You have to figure out um, how you're going to enact social change and, it's, and, uh, and then you have to do it. Can I uh, add a comment on that? So I, th I think what you're looking for is a, a, natural, a natural thing to look for, which is an intellectually respectable sort of guideline. And I think what I'm understanding from your discussion is that that's the wrong game to think that we're playing here. And it's not so much of a knowledge problem. I, I don't know that it's, it's a knowledge a, problem. It's, it's a not. social change problem with judges and society at large. Yeah. And so if, if I give you an intellectually respectable definition of sentience, it's perfect. Uh, the first thing that would happen upon going taking it to a court case is it probably be laughed out of court from what I'm hearing, right? So, so what are we looking for then is, I guess, something quite different, which I have a harder time to wrap my brain around, which is what is the system of persuasion by which you enact social change and convince a set of people who are brought up in the unchallenged assumption that only humans should be considered objects of moral concern to consider extending that to non-humans. And that to me is a really, I'd love to learn more. Yeah, and I'd remember, love to talk so remember we're only 150 years from not thinking that other humans are not acceptable as slaves either. It's, I just like, I mean, this, this, I, I, I see where you're coming from, but the slaves term seems like saying all animals are slaves, you know, so a, a yeast or a sponge or, you know, I, that, ter that term is a very loaded term. Do you, I mean, I'm, I'm just honest, uh, so I'm uncomfortable with that. Are you, can you justify that term? I mean, we're gonna go Actually, I, I, um, I, I, usually, I usually don't, don't use it um, because it raises, it raises a lot of hackles. And uh, in fact, uh, you know, if, if you've seen the HBO film about our work, Unlocking the Cage, you can actually watch a judge whose hackles I raised. 
come after me. You know, so, uh, um, it, it, you know, we, we all have our, like, we all have our points of view. And so, uh, so you know, when one judge will say, yeah, the other one will say, you're, you know, you're a horrible person. Uh, and you, and if you're arguing in front of seven judges, you'll have seven different points of view. And, uh, uh, some of them will agree with the idea of slave of slaves that they're that they are slaves. I don't, Frank. I never thought about a sponge as slaves, so I guess um, saying that all animals are slaves uh, probably was um, uh, well. Actually, I guess a sponge um, might be a slave, but I, or I, I don't know. I'm presumably the 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 slave would ha it has to have some sort of ability to should have some kind of autonomy so that you're taking something away from them. I'm not, I don't think you're really taking away, and they know it, as opposed to a sponge, although I, which I doubt, although having heard what I heard, just heard, maybe I'm wrong, maybe sponges do have some kind of autonomy, and I, you know, then they do know that I'm taking something away from them, and that, in that case, I have a whole different set of, of problems. Yeah. But, by the way, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the sentient being statutes that are, that are being passed. Um, to say animals are sentient beings is like, duh, yeah, <laughs> like no joke. Uh, it, it's, uh, they were sentient beings a long time before you said they were. And, uh, and also, as a practical matter, how has their lives changed as a result of them being sentient beings? And how have the actions of humans been circumscribed as a result of them being sentient beings. And so you, we've been writing an article about this for a few years, trying to look at the sentient being statutes, try to understand, do they actually mean anything or could they possibly even being, be used by people who don't want non-human animals to have certain kinds of rights or any kind of rights? And so what you do is you say, We've now made them sentient beings, and so everyone go home because we've like done a really good day's work, and don't come back to me for another ten years, you know, about animals. Hmm. I think we've had only one decision so far uh, that cited uh, the welfare and security law. I'm, I'm not sure what it's called in English. Very recently, like about a month or a month and a half ago. So indeed, it hasn't brought much change and I, I don't expect it will bring much change and on the use of the word slave the one I use is commodity I noticed that when okay. we decide or uh, we we treat uh, any group as a commodity we accept to exploit it and we accept that we have the right to exploit a commodity whether it's a natural resource or not uh, so uh, I think that's where the the issue is uh, if if any taxum any genus can be a, a commodity then it's accepted by the courts and by policymakers that we ought to protect the right to exploit that commodity but by the way if, if I can say one thing that actually contradicts everything I've been saying um, when I was in India last month I sat down with the Supreme Court justice there who wrote a, a decision in 2014 that said that all non-human animals all of them have constitutional rights and they have, have rights under the constitution in India. All of them, presumably, worms. I mean, all of them. Yeah. So, you know, as an American lawyer in the room, I said, you know, don't, I, I know they said that, but I frankly don't believe them. And, and w when I spoke to the judge, he clearly had religious kinds of, of um, reasons for, for saying this, but that's, that's that came out of the Supreme Court of India. That is a law of India. Um, however, we haven't seen that it's actually done anything yet. So one of the things we're trying to do, for example, is, that is, is work with Indian lawyers to bring a case in front of the Indian Supreme Court. Does this Asian elephant have, they say, a certain kind of right to bother liberty so he can't be imprisoned in a temple, for example? Or uh, uh, as it, is this one elephant, is that a subset of all non-human animals? So. Uh, um, stay tuned. So the examples you're using are these like sexy megafauna. What about the biologist researching crickets in the lab? Well, we, um, we're using sexy megafauna because they're sexy megafauna. Um, uh, we, we have 
the, the way humans are constructed, the way at least our, in, in our culture, or the way uh, we, you, know, you can't, you know, we can't as lawyers go into a court arguing that crickets have rights or worms have rights uh, or chickens have rights or any, you know, for any of any non-human animal who we're eating or we're, we're, we're tremendously exploiting. We, the time is not yet right. You know, we're, we're still at the point of trying to kick open the door and then we, once we kick open the door, which we are doing, then we'll have to see who, who, can, who, who we can get through there. And also there's now, there's a century from now, and there's a millennium from now. But I guess my point is, if somebody is saying that all animals are sentient beings with constitutional rights, um, across Canada there's 12 labs studying crickets, we've got probably 1.3 million crickets in captivity, how many elephants are there in captivity? Three. I mean, if we're just going by numbers, maybe we should all release the crickets. And then on top of that, crickets are becoming the major protein source across the world. So that's a whole new farm animal. I, I, I predict <laughs> that crickets will not get constitutional rights in Canada for at least the next year. Okay, good. <laughs> 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 Okay, I, I want to go a bit more on the definition of things. I found quite interesting that you care about human reasoning, try to convince other people. You, you need to dabble both with uh, animal reasoning and human reasoning, understand how the two can connect. Um, seeing autonomy as a result behavior could be a way to do it. So autonomy is, is a result of some other process that come before, maybe some uh, computational explanation of how autonomy came to be and especially how uh, things are felt, Dabirian autonomy could help crack open a little bit of the door because autonomy seems to be accepted, it's very uh, human-like, uh, but when we underlie the process, the, the processes behind this autonomy, it's not that different from the rest of the animal. So maybe some, maybe if judges could understand a bit of, of com computational modeling, uh, you could you could list the criteria. And I've been listening exactly for those criteria for the last three days, and some of them uh, uh, refer to the information be treated some way or another. And I've noted. Uh, many uh, researchers had a different uh, perspective on that. Uh, information felt is like the top. It's, uh, Stephen keeps saying uh, what is felt is what is sentient, right? Sentience is about feeling. But there were also examples, uh, even using humans, um, if you, you have some surgical, uh, little surgical uh, uh, operation or exam, maybe they will not put you completely under. They will give you some kind of cocktail so you'll forget you have felt something. So this was another way to see it, information that was stored into the memory. The information felt that was stored seemed to be a more, uh, uh, a more reliable. And later on, information that is uh, used to plan uh, seemed to be even higher up because you go into the decision making. So those, I see those as some sort of criteria that relate to very human things we do. And so maybe that could be a bit convincing. They, maybe that could open a little bit of door, right? Information felt, stored, used for planning that could give a sense for the judge of what it means to be sentient because they rely to the autonomy that they already value, right? But I think you're doing tremendous work. I don't know if you see this computational way as a way to open the door. I think I do see it, but maybe I'm, I'm, I'm crazy. I don't know. <laughs> I think that's just a comment. Um, so the regime of rights and personhood is fairly culturally determined. Uh, it rests on assumptions of autonomy and rationality and self-identity that don't hold for all the humans that enjoy personhood legally. They might not even hold for any of the humans that enjoy personhood legally. Um, and I'm wondering if there's a danger in being too successful in sort of kludging rights language. 
to protect animals to the point that we keep doubling down on a monotonic moral uh, project where it's all about rights and personhood? Should we be developing in parallel to obviously the need to use concepts that have traction right now legally and say yes, whether or not it's vertical, we can make an effective case for rights uh, for animals and just stop the harms now. But should we be, aw should we be wary of the danger of doubling so much down on this project of rights that we sort of reach the end of a coherent theory of rights. And I think there's some interspecies politics stuff that is beyond that, that veil of coherence uh, and say, oh, we, we still left stuff out and we've, extent, we've uh, reached the end of the usefulness of this tool and we've forgotten how to use any others. Because um, I think it's quite likely that we're going to have to find different footings and legally um, enshrine different footings of moral concern for things we think deserve protection, but cannot, under any coherent schema, uh, qualify as persons. I'm wondering if that's something that's in, specifically, uh, Mr. Wise, if that's something in your head as well while you're doing this necessary uh, rights track. Well, uh, no, I, as, as, as I said, for example, the idea of autonomy is that uh, we always argue that uh, we argue that autonomy is a sufficient but not a necessary condition for rights and point out that, you know, the obvious that there are millions and millions of humans who are not autonomous and, you know, and, and who have rights. And, um, and you know how the judges explain that? There, there's usually one sentence in, in which they say, well, just because you, you're not autonomous doesn't mean that you should be stripped of all your rights. And that is the most, that's the deepest explanation I've ever seen in a judicial opinion, which is, you know, one sentence. Uh, so what, what, we, what we do is try now, you know, and we, you know, we, we're at, we're at, as I sometimes say, you know, we're at the end of the age of animal welfare, or we're coming to the end, and we're at the beginning of the age of rights for non-human non animals. So right now we're trying to create that age and we're trying to begin it. You know, once we begin it, then it, it will go all kinds of ways. Um, and and yeah, it'll go all kinds of ways, and I can't really predict, um, predict what, what those ways will be, but uh, the way we think that we have the best shot of, of kicking the door open is by adopting, whether we personally agree with it or not, is by adopting or for with respect to for purposes of our legal argument the values and principles that the judges themselves say they hold because it seems to me to be a fool's errand to argue someone out of their principles they're you know they're they're not they're not going to do it they they nobody does it you're not going to argue me out of my principles uh, you you just can't so what we need to do is find out what principle we say basically we're saying hey judge what do you believe in you believe in that? Well, let me, I got something for you. And you know, that's where we're arguing now. Now, once that is more accepted than, than it is now, then you can start bringing in other, other kinds of, of, of theory, which I think will inevitably happen because of the extension to environmental objects, because of, of I think, the, uh, potentially robots or artificial intelligence entities. Sometimes I say, you know, if we ever run into um, exobiological life, if we decide we want to clone a Neanderthal, I mean, there's all kinds of, of, of ways in which uh, the paradigms we have are, are, are beginning to, to shake. But right now, they are overwhelmingly the dominant paradigms. And you can either make your arguments, you know, so you all float down the, the river together, not, not fighting about the underlying paradigms, or you can get into a fight about the, the truth of the underlying paradigms, and we think there we don't have a chance in the world. Okay, we have four minutes left. So how about we go here and then here? Two quick ones? Yeah, I got a quick question. Uh, Simon, I have a quick question for you. I was curious about why you connected the more kind of generalized approach with the kind of killjoy answer, the associative answer. And the reason for that is because in the tradition of philosophy, often the more kind of generalized um, approach is connected with the distinctly human. So, for example, um, when Descartes says he could always distinguish between animals and robots on one side and humans on the other, it's by the th two things that humans have that they don't have. And they are language 
and the universal tool of reason. This sounds like something like a generalized approach to me. Um, so I'm curious why you see the associative approach is kind of more, it seems like you're seeing like kind of lower order or um, the more kind of killjoy answer. So, what, so why, is, why do I see the associative one as more killjoy than, what's the alternative, say? The, um, well, I'm curious why you see the, because you said you, there's the, I can't remember the order in the explanations, but uh, you said either social learning is a kind of more generalized approach, mm -hmm. or it's just kind of specifically evolved For specific uh, capacity. Yeah. Um, and if I remember correctly, you associated the uh, generalized approach with um, the kind of more associative. Is that correct? Or am I yeah. Yeah. Now? Yeah. So I mean, I, I mean, I think. I don't want to get too tied up on this term killjoy. I mean, I, I was what I was trying to do with that term, and I was using it in the sense that some philosophers of biology use it today. Um, so um, by separating the kind of the and they and they, and they're often using it in a sense of trying to divide people that are kind of um, using human um, cognition as a kind of starting point, and assuming that that's present in in non-human primates, for example, versus you know the the kind of Kilgore school of thought. So it's not, it's, I think the meanings changed a little bit over time. And, I, and I, I think it was just to kind of give you a bit of framework to, to, I kind of follow that kind of, I mean, that parsimony, I mean, I could have said Lord Morgan's canon, like this kind of principle of parsimony, Wacom's razor, you know, that's, I, ask, I, I, I say in general, I think we should try and start with a simple explanation. What a simple explanation is, is obviously difficult to determine. But I think the, the, the reason that um, I see those associative ones, I would put them in that kind of killjoy school of simpler explanations is because we know that associative learning exists, so it's already there. So if we can explain a, um, a phenomenon like social learning with an existing, um, uh, an existing phenomenon, an existing thing that's already there, the associative learning, then we don't have to um, come up with anything else. You know, so it's simple in that, in that sense. So that's why I would put it in that killjoy school. Is that answering the question? I'm not quite sure if I've... Yeah, I was more kind of interested in the connection between the associative approach and the generalized approach. Maybe I should avoid the word killjoy. Um, is it just because it associative is well, the, the lower order? So well, the, the, the associative is thought to be a general process that's shared across most animals. Um, so that's why the associative account would be there's this general process, associative learning, that is... Um, so the general process is associative learning. That's, okay, thanks. Yeah, does it make sense? Okay. Um, it's 5.30, so that's the end of the session. Um, please join me in thanking this afternoon's panelists. <laughs>